So if you're looking at this, you know, what are the probabilities of an event? So you can have a probability of zero, as low as zero, or as high as one, right? Zero is no chance of that happening, right? A probability of zero is never going to happen. A prob probability of one, 100% or always, right? So it's between zero and one. You're looking at a decimal, right? And it's really a percentage or probabilities percentage, right? So that's your span. Does that make sense? Zero is the lowest, can't, will not ever happen. One's the highest, right? So everything between those, encompassing those, are valid um, are valid choices. So the first one says, which of the following numbers could be a probability of an event? So, yeah, we can have zero, right? Zero is a probability. Yeah, like... What about negative 0 0.49? Is that a, a, a probability? No. The reason why is it's negative, right? Okay, so we can't do that. How about 0 0.21? Okay. Of course, one, right? That's, a, that's and then 0 0.03. And then I got 1.28. So is 1.28 a viable answer for a probability? Nah. So your two things here are, you know, you're excluding a negative and you're excluding values that are greater than one, right? Okay. Any questions on that? Okay. All right. So this second problem here is more in line of what you would talk about the empirical rule, right? Uh, suppose you toss a coin 100 times. You toss it 100 times. You get 72 heads and 28 tails. Based on the results, which, what is the probability of the next flip result, resulting in a head, right? Well, it's empirical, right? Because we've ran an experiment. So how many heads have we got thus far? 72. Out of how many times did we run that experiment? 100, which would be 0 0.7 what? 2, right? Round to two decimal places. Okay. Any questions on that? Again, empirical is based off trials that you've simulated, right? And the classical is more theoretical. Okay. All right. Y'all good online? Okay. All right. So, y'all good in here? Yep. Let's see. Go back in. See what my people are. All right. So, this one, um, We're looking at a bag of tulips, right? And uh, so let's look. A bag of 100 tulips purchased from a nursery contains 35 red, 25 yellow, and 40 purple tulip bulbs. What is the probability that, that a randomly selected tulip bulb is red, right? Well, how many reds do we have? 35 of them. Out of how many? A hundred. And if you do that, that equals what? 0.35, right? Probability of getting a red out of a hundred, right? Any questions? Okay. So B says, what is the probability that, that a randomly selected tulip bulb is purple? Well, I have 40 purple tulips, right? To choose from. Out of how many? hundred, which is what? 0.4. Okay. Now, interpret these two po two possibilities. Select the choice that below and fill in the extra with your best choice. If a hundred tulips were sampled with replacement, one would expect about 
are exactly x to be red and then x to be purple. So the two things that are different on here, we have to choose which one. Is it going to be about or exactly? It's going to be about because it's a probability, right? Are they always going to be 35 red tulips, 25 and 40? No, not always, right? So that's why it's about. So you'll have, you'll just stick these answers down here, right? Um, 0 0.35 for that and then 0 0.4 for, for that. Any questions? Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure <laughs> whether, I mean, I'm not sure whether they're going to want you to put 35, but, or, well, I guess they would want you to put, I would think, the probability. Okay. My thinking is they're probably wanting the probability of 0.35 and then 0.4. If you put that in and it marks it wrong, then do the 35 and 40, right? Um, on that one, that's a little bit ambiguous on, on what, but I'm pretty sure they're going to want the probabilities there. Okay. All right. Yeah, it's never going to be ex exactly, right? So, all right, any questions on that? No good? Yeah? All right, where are these problems coming from? From your homework okay this way when you get to your homework you at least have got a little bit better understanding of, of what it's asking and how to interpret because i think that's that's probably the disconnect or the trouble that you're having is okay what do they want it's not that you can't do the math it's like what do they want me to do right uh that's that's probably some of your frustrations so let's look at this one a national survey of college students were asked, how, do you, how often do you wear a seatbelt when riding in a car driven by someone else, right? And the response frequencies appear in the table to the right, all right? So uh, construct a probability model for seatbelt use by a passenger, okay? Would you consider it to be, and then part B, would you consider it to be unusual to find a, a college student who never wears a seatbelt when riding or not, right? Um, we'll kind of get that get to that one, but here's the frequency, right? So what what was the first thing that we've got to do? Think about it. We're using the classical, right? So it's how many I have of a, what I want over how many that I have that I chose from, right? So the first thing I would want to do is do a what? A, do a total, right, of all these, because what you're going to give is is basically a relative frequency, correct? That's really what you're doing. Um, so I've got 400, not 400, 4,422 when I add all mine up, right? So calculate the probability of a never. Well, a never is what? 116 out of how many? Right, 4,422, right? And if I do that, then I get this. And it said to the nearest thousand, so I'll go out three decimal places. And then, you know, this is part A. It could be a, it could be asking you, um, you know, different ones. You might get rarely. You might you may get most of the time, so forth and so on, right? Um, would you consider it unusual to find a college student who never wears? Yeah. Why? Yeah, it's 2.6% of the people that are in the passenger 
side that's wearing a seatbelt, uh, that's not wearing a seatbelt, right? What's the most dangerous spot in a car? Passenger, front passenger seat. Statistically, that is the most dangerous spot. Yeah. The driver, and I hate to say this, but what's your, if you see something coming at you, what are you going to do? Not in a car, but if something was thrown at you, what's your first reaction? Flinch, move out of the way, get right. So, what do you, ha we, do you understand why? Right. Because the, the driver's natural reaction, it's not bad or good or bad, it's just, to swerve or to you know not be so who does that leave? There you go. So yeah, I always sit in the back. Yeah, sit in the back. So yeah, sorry. And sometimes, well, I just sit in the back if I don't drive. So all right, question. No good. All right. So this one I think is the last one in 5-1, okay? So Robert, Marco, and Dominique work for a publishing company. Um, the company wants to send two employees to a statistical conference. To be fair, the company decides that these two individuals who get to attend will have their names randomly drawn from a hat. So the first thing that we have to do is this, it says create a sample space of the experiment. That is, list all the possible random samples of size n equals two, right? So if we're looking at this, R is Robert, M is Marco, and D is Dominique, right? So two of them are going, correct? Sample size of two. So my first one is Robert and Marco, right? My other choice would be Robert and what? Or Roberto and Dominique, right? And then, of course, what I got? Marco and Dominique. So that's my sample space, correct? Now, this one just happened to be three. You may, on your homework, or your problem may be four or five of them. But you see how I took each one, right? So, um, order does not matter on this, on this sample space. Uh, Marco, Roberto is the same as what? Roberto and Marco. Does that make sense? The combinations, permutation types. Uh, conversations. So anyway, there's that. B, uh, what's the probability that Roberto and Marco attend the conference? How many of Roberto and Marcos do I have? One out of how many? Out of three, which is what? 0 0.33, right? Fair enough. Um, C, what's the probability that Dominique attends the conference? Well, Dominique is in how many of my sample spaces? Two of them, right? Out of how many did we have to choose from? Three, which would be 0 0.66 or, or I go there, six, seven, round it, right? And then what's the probability that Roberto stays at home? One third? Because Roberto, to stay at home, that means Roberto's not going, right? So there's only one of these out of three that Roberto stays at home. The other two says Roberto goes. So there you go. Now, this particular example only had three choices, right? Yours may have more than that. It wouldn't. It will, and you'll get to that in chapter six. Now you'll you'll get into it. Uh, it's the and this and that. Um, but right now we're just looking at it in terms of um, both of them being in a, in a particular situation, right? 
uh, instead of I guess it would be the most it would be the multiplicative of, yeah yeah so good question though all right so any questions on five one so that's we we looked at experimental or no empir, em, empirical right which dealt with trial and then we looked at classical which is more your theoretical more that we're used to right so these there's a couple more problems that deal with five one just a couple more that are dealing with some uh content type questions but all in all this particular one that represents the homework questions that we have in chapter five section one okay any questions about that anybody all right does it make a little bit more sense to to do the homework bring in homework problems well i guess i could ask you that probably monday of next week because you're you're probably your brain right now is probably stuck on homework for chapter four right yeah so all right any questions online before we move on to section two we're good all right so here we go um five two right and this one in this section we're going to talk about the addition rule for disjoints are mutually exclusive right this joints mean one is not affected by the other right or they're independent of one another right if you think about disjoint you think about venn diagrams the two circles not touch it um and then the general addition rule we got this one or this one right and then compute the probability uh using the complement rule so those are the three things that we'll talk about within five two okay all right so let's kind of look at this if two events are disjoint or two events are disjoint if they have no outcomes in common right another name for disjoints events is mutually mutu mutually not musically mutually exclusive events right so the addition rule for disjoints events is if e and f are disjoint meaning they're independent of one another right then the probability of e or f would be the probability of e plus the probability of f okay these th these two probabilities are not um dependent upon one another. they're independent right events now the addition rule for disjoints can be extended to more than one disjoint for example if e f and g have no outcomes in common then they can be paired together we just keep on adding in the probabilities for those single independent events right okay so it could include more than two so don't don't freak out on me on that okay now the general addition rule generally uh for two events uh the probability of e or f is equal to the probability of e plus the probability of f minus the probability of e and f happening that means they have something in common right okay um for example if i said what's the probability of uh, hearts are seven right well, I can do the probability of hearts, right? Which would be, if you think about it, each suit is 13 out of 52 cards, right? So that's 13 out of 52. Sevens, there's four sevens, right? And then, do I have a seven of hearts? Then I would have to subtract that because I don't want to double count it. Does that make sense? So that's what the, if they can both happen at the same time, then we have to take into account that, right? non-independent or non-mutually exclusive event so let's look at this one you know suppose that a pair of dice are shown right let e be the first die is a two and then f be the sum of the dice is less than or equal to five now the real key thing is less than or equal to what five right okay so the sum of it right so the first one has to be two and then the second 
thing we're looking at is the summation of the two together. It has to be less than or equal to 5. So what's the probability of E or F used in the general addition rule? So here's all of our sample space, right? And if you have two dice, then you have a 36 outcome sample space, right? Like if you do 1 through 6 on the left-hand side, then 1 through 6 on the top, and you pair them together, right? 1, 1, 1, 2, blah, blah, blah. You've got 36 different outcomes. So here's the sample space here. So what's the probability that the first die is a 2? What's the probability that the first die is a 2? Huh? Well, the, pro the probability that there's a 2, the first one's a 2, is you should have, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, what? 6 out of 36, which is what? 1, 6, right? So I don't want to reduce it yet because I'm going to show you something that's pretty cool. Uh, what's the probability of uh, there being um, a sum of 5, less than or equal to 5? Well, this would give me 2, right? This gives me 3. This gives me 4. This one gives me 5. So these right here are good, right? This gives me 3. This gives me what? 4. That gives me what? 5, right? This gives me what? 4. And this one gives me what? Five. So how many have got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, what? Huh? Is there one more? Did I grab one, two? That's five, five, five. So let me count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, right? Right there. Ten. So that's ten out of how many? Right. So it'd be what? Uh, greater than or equal to what? Five, right? No, less than. Sorry. Boom. Put less than or equal to five, right? So that's ten out of thirty-six. Now, can we have a dice that has two as the first one and has a sum less than five? How many of them are they? Well, this one's one, right? What we got here? That one? What? That one and what? That one. Correct? So that's how many? That would be three out of what? 36. So I got six out of 36. Uh-oh. I wrote, wrote it in the wrong place. Sorry. Let me go over here. Uh, 6 out of 36, probability of to E. Uh, 10 out of 36 would be the probability of to F minus 3 out of 36, right? So what happens when you add subtract with the same common denominator? You just take care of the numerator, right? 6 plus 10 is 16 minus 3 is what? 13 out of 36. So that's why I said don't reduce. It makes it a little bit easier. And they probably are going to, more likely, they'll have you round it, right? That particular one, right? Does that make a little bit more sense? Okay, so we had some redundancy there that we had to take out because we, had, we don't want to count it twice, right? Does that make sense? So if you've got an event that it can happen, both of these things can happen, then I need to subtract that. They're not mutually exclusive. They're not independent of one another, if that can happen, right? So that's the two things we're looking at from addition rule. Both of them happen at the same time or both of them not happening. So uh, I stuck this one there just so you could kind of see. They reduced it, but I, I tend to like this. Boom, and then that, right? And then you've got it, you know, you've got it down here, which is very easy. You can see how it's 13. Right. Um, I don't do this, even though 
Okay, we know it's going to be simplified. It's just a lot easier. All right, so the complement of an event, right? Um, let S be the sample space of a probability experiment, and let E denote an event, right? The complement of E is denoted E superscript C, right? Superscript means it's up. Sub means it's down, right? So the complement of E, E to the C, right? Um, is all outcomes in the sample space that are not in the green circle, right? It's not in the green circle. So the complement will be 1 minus probability of E. So if they give you a probability that something would happen and they want to complement, well, then it's 1 minus that. So if it's a 40% chance it's, that it's going to rain, what would be the complement to that? Right, 60% that it's not, right? It ju it does not mean 40% of your day it would rain, right? Y'all, yeah. I had some colleagues that that was what they believed. And they taught math. It was bad. I just kind of shook my head. All right. Any questions on that? So we're looking at really the big thing that we're kind of putting an umbrella is the addition rule. Are they events that can happen together or are they exclusive, right? Are they independent of one another? Okay, that's the two variations. Now, and then the complement, right? So let's kind of look at this. Um, probability experiment is conducted in which a sample space uh, S is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, right? And then event E is 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and event G is 9, 10, 11, 12, right? Assuming that the outcome is equally likely, uh, list outcomes in E and G, and then are E and G mutually exclusive, right? So the outcomes, are there any outcomes, list outcomes in E and G that would be in both of them, right? Well, E is 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, right? And G is 9, 10, 11, 12. So are there any of those outcomes in either one of them? Nah. So you wouldn't have this. You would have an empty set, right? And this is, I hate to say, it's, it's, that's more of an algebra with the brackets that are just sitting there that you're not putting anything. It's the empty set. There's no answers that go into it, right? Okay. Now, are these mutually exclusive? Well, yeah, because event E and event G have what? No outcomes, right? Does that make sense? Okay. So, you know, if we were to look at S and E, if we were to look at S and E, well, we got a different thing, right? If we look at S and E, then we got like three, four, five, six, and seven, right? Which would go up here for A. That would be in both of them, right? And they would not be mutually exclusive, would they? No. Okay. So, any questions about that? Y'all good? Yeah? All right. So, let's kind of look at this. I've got, a, there's one, two, three, there's four problems here. Um. We'll do this A, B, C, and D. Um, it says find the probability of an indicated event if P of E equals 0.25 and P of F equals 0.5, 4 or 5, right? Find P of E or F if E and F equals 0.15. So what does the, if P and, if the probability of E and F equals 0.15, what does that tell you? What does this little thing right here, this little statement right there that I just highlighted tell you? They're not mutually, they're not mutually exclusive, right? They're not independent of one another, right? So what we'd have to do is we would have to use, you know, we're, we're looking at the probability of what? E, 
plus the probability of F minus the probability of E and F, right? That's what the probability of ERF would be, right? So if we look at this, then probability of E is 0 0.25, right? And the probability of F is what? 0 0.45. And if I subtract the 0 0.15 from there, what does it give me? What does it give me? Yeah, 0 0.55. What? Five, five. Yeah? Okay. I want you to look at B. I want you to take about, I don't know, about 15, 20 seconds, maybe 30 seconds, and kind of look at that. And um, look at B, C, and D. I'll let you do B, C, and D, right? We'll give you, I don't know, a minute or two. Yeah, that okay? We get about a minute, minute and a half, right? Okay. So let's kind of look at that, uh, look at B real quick. Prob probability of E or F, if they're mutually what? That means E and F can't, they're not dependent upon one another, right? Does that mean they can't happen, so we don't have to exclude them happening at the same time, right? Um, so basically, it's probability of E plus probability of F, right? Which would be 0 0.30 plus 0 0.45, which, ladies and gentlemen, gives me what? Seven what? Five. Question. All right. So let's kind of look at C. Find the probability of E's complement if the probability of E is 0.27, right? Well, the complement is, the probability of E's complement is one minus the probability of E, right? So one minus 0 0.27 would be what? 0 0.73? Any questions about that one? All right, now this bottom one is really the one that I, Real, I wouldn't say I really want you to kind of consider, but let's do this. What'd you get for an answer? Huh? I got a point three. Anybody get anything different? I got a point three in class. What about online? Anybody get anything different? No. All right. Um, well, let's let's see. Uh, they told us the probability of E is 0.55. The probability of E or F is 0.7. Wait, they just gave us the end result, right? And then the probability of E and F is 0.15. Find probability of F. Well, you've got to do this. The probability of E or F right, equals the probability of E plus the probability of what? F minus the probability of E and what? F, right? They're not independent. How do I know they're not independent or mutually exclusive? They gave me both events happening, right, together. So, um, e of F is 0 0.70, probability of E is 0 0.55. Do we know what the probability of F, F is? Nah. So X for an unknown, right? Uh, e and F is uh, 0 0.15. So if we go ahead and combine like terms, right? 0 0.70 equals what? 0 0.4, right? O plus X, and of course, We'll just go ahead and do what? Subtract 0 0.4, right? So 0 0.30 equals what? X, which is the probability of what? F, right? All right, do you see that little algebra there? 
just kind of laying it out, plugging in what I have, because right now on this problem, the probability of f is missing, right? Your problem, it may be the probability e, may be the probability of e and f, right? It's going to be one of the three on the right-hand side. Okay? Any questions about that? Anybody? Y'all good? All right. Now, let's go have some fun. This one, we're looking at 52 cards in a deck, right? So let's kind of, let's just talk cards. There's four suits, right? Each suit has how many cards in it? 13, right? Because 4 times 13 is what? 52, right? So you have 13 hearts. You have 13 spades. You have 13 clubs. You have 13 what? Diamonds, right? They all, the cards from that goes from 2 all the way to 10. Then jack, queen, king, what? Ace, right? So, if you do that, there's 13 for each suit. Now, in these problems, you have to determine whether things are mutually exclusive or not. That means, can you have both of them happen at the same time? For example, probability, let's just look, kind of look at the first one. The probability of what? A jack and a what? So probability of jack or what? An ace. Well, I want to ask something. Are they independent or are they dependent? Can you have those same things happen at the same time? Or are they exclusive? So how many of y'all say they can't happen at the same time? At two, three? How many of y'all say they can happen at the same time? me so let's go figure out why Palmer said me okay and you, it'll make a little bit more sense maybe hopefully um, so the probability of Jack right plus the probability of a what an eight minus the probability oh, wait 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 let me back up let me back up I just, I just flub dubbed it. You can't have an eight and a jack at the same time. My bad. I, I just, my brain just went, and I now it's just, now I'm back on the merry-go-round. I went around. around so, okay, so let me back up. Y'all three are correct. I'm wrong. And if you are on online and you said, oh, they can't have a jack and an eight. All right. So. Um, Let's talk, is face, face cards are jack, queen, kings, right? Yeah, okay, good. Just want to make sure. It's been a while, right? So, um, all right. So, you can't have a jack and an eight. They don't make it, do they? Okay, good. So, these are mutually exclusive, right? So, what's the probability of a jack? How many jacks do you have? Four out of how many? 52 plus how many eights do you have? Equals, guess what? Eight out of what? And then you put it as a decimal, right? You with me? All right, good. Whew. All right. I don't know why my brain went. My brain had two. I was thinking. Uh. I was thinking suits. I had suits in my mind. Yeah, I, I had suits. So, all right. Okay, so let's look at B. Compute the probability of randomly selecting a jack or eight or seven. Well, are they mutually exclusive? Are they... Can, can we have a card that has jack, eight, and seven on it? Nah. So they're mutually exclusive, right? So what we're looking at 
It's the probability of a what? A jack or eight or what? Seven, right? So that would be, let's see, what's the probability of a jack? Y'all said four out of 52, right? What's the probability of an eight? Four out of 52. What's the probability of a seven? So what would that be? Twelve out of fifty-two, right? And of course, you convert that over into a what? Decimal, right? Now, let's look at C. Probability of a seven or spade, right? So here's where my brain was going on the first one. Can you have a seven spade? Yes, you can, because spade is a suit, right? All right, so yeah, we could have that. So you can have both of those happen at the same time, so we need to subtract that so that we're not double counting. Does that make sense? Y'all with me now? Good. All right, so the probability of a seven plus the probability of a spade minus the probability of what? Seven and what? Good. So what's the probability of a seven? Four out of how many? 52, right? Yeah, don't reduce that to 113. Okay, one out of 13. Don't do that because we're going to keep, see how we kept all the denominators 52? We just said add or subtract stuff on top, right? Plus a spade is how many? 13. That's a suit, right? So there's 13 spades out of 52 cards minus how many sevens of spades do we have? Just what? One out of 52 cards, right? So 4 plus 13 is what? 17 minus 1 is what? 16 out of 52. Ladies and gentlemen, that converts over into a what? Over into a decimal, right? Yeah? All right. Now, that really is it for 5-2. Uh, All right. We're just doing the addition. We had mutually exclusive or events that could happen at the same time. That was the only two scenarios we were looking at, right? Now, so let me do this real quick. Um, determine whether the scatter plot diagram indicates a linear relationship may exist between the two variables. If the linear, if the relationship is linear, determine whether it's positive or negative association between it. Well, first off. Look at the scatter plot. Kind of appears to be in what type of form or fashion? A line, right? Okay, so therefore, it's pretty high probability, right? Correlation coefficient, probably going to be a, a really high number close to one, right? Um, is it going to be positive or negative? It's going to be a positive. Why? It, look at the slope. That's really what, how's the, how's the graph going as as the X's are going from left to right, as X's are increasing, what are my outputs doing? Are they going up or are they going down, right? Think about the linear relationship. So yeah, it's got a positive slope, so therefore it will have a positive what? Relationship. So the questions that I have is, do these two variables have a linear relationship? Well, of course, right? They have it because they lie mainly in a what? Straight line, right? So you could exclude B and D because that says do, does not, right? So let's kind of look at C. These points have a linear relationship because they do not lie mainly in a straight line? Nah. All right. Do the two variables have a positive or negative? Well, they have a positive, right, because of the slope, correct? Any questions about that one? All right. Now, let's look at the third one. And this says identify or attach the correlation coefficient to the graphs, right? So we've got uh, A is a correlation of 0 0.523, B's correlation of 1, and then C's correlation is 0 0.87, right? So they're all positive, would y'all agree? So there should be a positive slope. Now, so we have a 0 0.5, a 0 0.7, and a 1. So which one is the easiest one to pick out? The 1, right? Because it better be a straight line, right? So that's easy. So if I look at B, which com or compares to R equals 1, then I'm going to put uh, the third one, right? Okay, now, 
0 0.7, 0.5. So I got one and two. Which one looks like it's more scattered? Yeah, the first one. Look at it. I mean, if you had to put a band around those, the band on that one would be a little bit spread as compared to what uh, the second one is, right? Does that make sense? Any questions about that? Right, do you see how? And if you go back and look at our notes, I gave you a, uh, they had like, I don't know, eight examples of positive and what? Negative relationships, right? Or correlations. And data plots or scatter plots on that, right? All right. Okay. So match the linear correlation to the scatter plot below. Negative 0 0.038. Well, first off, it's negative, right? So, so that excludes which one? The first one, right? Because that's a what? Positive. So maybe B, maybe D, maybe C, right? So let's kind of look at those. Um, negative 0 0.038. That's close to what? Negative 1 or to 0? What's it close to? Zero, which means that if it's at zero, does it have an association or relationship? No. So which one do you think has that could be C? Does that make sense? D would have a stronger correlation coefficient than who? B, right? But it'd still be negative. Do you all understand why it would be negative? Because the slope is going downward, right? Any questions on that one? Um, okay. So, said draw a scatter plot by hand, compute the correlation coefficient. No. No, 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 no. Do not do this by hand. Do not do this by hand, okay? Um, click on this. You get the data set, right? Okay. There's what? Five points? So not a huge data set, correct? So if I take that data set, then what I want to do is I want to plug it into my calculator. So what I want to do is I want to run through this one time and kind of show you how to do that so you'll have it. And then when we get to them again, I'll say, okay, you need to plug this in and kind of do it. Does that make sense? So this one I'll work out and I'll talk probably talk a little bit more about it than some of the other because I want to make sure that you're solid on this. Now, let me uh, let me write these down. So I've got two, four, four, eight, six, eleven, six, thirteen, and seven, eighteen. All right. So there's my data set. Okay. Now it gave me a critical values table, right? All right. Y'all understand what the critical values table? If your correlation coefficient is bigger than your critical value then there's a relationship, a linear relationship that exists, right? Okay, so how many points are in it? We've got one, two, three, four, five, right? So our N is five. If you look at that, we have a uh, critical value of 0 0.878, right? Do you all see that? Now, here we go. First things first. When I get to my calculator, I don't know what I've typed in here, right? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do this keystroke, second plus four. And what that does is it brings up a little thing called clear all my lists. Now, that's handy because guess what? I'm starting with a fresh slate, right? Period. So, so I'm going to go second plus four. And what that does is it clears it, right? Everything's clear. Don't have to worry about typing over data. I don't want to type over data because if I type over data, I'm probably going to make a mistake. So I'm going to hit stat and enter because that's where I'm going to go edit. Make sure you're in L1, okay? And I'm just going to put what? Two enter, four enter, six enter, six enter, and seven, right? Pretty quick. And then arrow over to the right to L2. Then I'll put 4 enter, 8 enter, 11 enter, 13 enter, and 18, right? Boom. Double check. Make sure that what I've typed in is correct. 
won't take you less than three seconds to do that. Do your X's and then do your Y's. Now, any questions about that? Okay, so the first thing that they want us to do is they want us to do a scatter plot, right? They want us to do a scatter plot. So I'm going to go up here and I'm going to say second Y equals. And I'm going to turn my st stat plots on. So I'm going to hit enter to go in. And mine are on right now, right? And I want to make sure that I have the first selection, which would just be the dots. And then L1 and L2 is where my list is coming from, and I'm putting it in blue, right? So at this point, I've got my stat plot on. I know where they're coming from. I'm just going to hit graph. Now, look at that. What did I forget to do? I got something sitting over here in my equation editor, right? I got some some equation I've been working with that I want I need to make sure it's wiped out, right? So if you hit y equals, that's your equation after. I'm just going to hit clear. And what that does is it takes it away, right? So I now I can go back to graph, and there's nothing there, right? Well, that's okay because there's a magic sequence that's going to make it look pretty. It's going to be pretty right there, right? What is that sequence? It's amen, right? Like when you forget something in math, you start praying, right? Yeah. No. You got to remember this. Zoom what? Zoom 9, which is zoom stat, right? You're zooming in for a stat plot, right? Okay, so look at this. Look at my, my data points, right? So I got boom, boom. I got two sixes, right? I got X's are two six, so that means I got stack points. And then that furthest one, that next data point, seven, is kind of up there, right? So let's go compare this. Which one of them right there looks like uh, like we just looked at? Which one? D, right? Yeah. There you go. Right there. That's as easy as it gets, right? But you got to be able to do it. If you don't have one of these graphic calculators, then you need to beg, borrow, and not steal. We don't want you in jail. You got five weeks, no, four weeks, five weeks this week, four weeks next week, right? And then we're done. Hold on, strap in, it's a roller coaster ride. Yeah, um, it, there's a PDF file that's up on Blackboard that says calculator stuff. Um, it may show you how to do a stat plot on TI 84, it's PDF, and it's got a little uh, camera thing that's right beside it. If you click on it, it goes to a video. Or all you have to do is say, how to do a stat plot with a TI 84. Yeah, YouTube, man, you got like 15 million, right? Like everybody wants to be famous on that. All right, so here's the thing. Our next one says by hand compute the correlation coefficient. No way, Jose. We're not doing that, right? Work smarter, not harder. This is a tool. We're going to use it, right? So we're going to go back over our calculator. And we're going to say, okay, my list and everything is in L1 and L2, right? So if I go to stat, and then arrow over to the right, I do number four. Now, we talked about what the difference was four and eight, right? The difference of four and eight, who's the slope and who's the wire set, right? They're the same regression. Okay, so I'm going to do number four, right? So boom, I hit that. L1, L2, that's where my X and Y's are coming from. Now, you could store the regression equation if you wanted to. Anybody know that keystroke? Can I talk about that keystroke. You could do it, and it's this. It's bars, arrow to the right, enter, enter. Bars, arrow to the right, enter, enter. That is the keystroke. That will automatically bring up Y1. Okay, so what's the big deal of storing it in Y1? Well, this problem doesn't ask you to graph the line in over the scatter plot, but one of the other problems will. So if you already know how to do it, guess what? Win a winner chicken dinner, right? So there. No harm, no foul. It's just arrow, bars, arrow to the right, enter, enter. Now you can go down and hit calculate. Do you have to store it in Y1? You don't. But if it stores it, then I don't, I don't have to type it up so it's less chance for me to make a mistake, right? So I'm at calculate, I hit enter, right? Now, if my diagnostic is on, right? Y'all remember that? Mode, 
you may have to go down to page two to see diagnostic on, make sure it's on. Or second, zero, which is catalog, just keep scrolling down, and you hit diagnostic on, make sure it's on, right? That's the only way you're going to get R, the variance, and or coefficient of determination, right? And then the coefficient of correlation, right? Or, yeah, R is 0.95, right? Boom. Did we have to calculate it by hand? The correlation coefficient? No. So, there. So, I put in 0.95, right? Because the correlation, correlation coefficient is positive, then when I take the absolute value of it, it will still be 0.95, right? If it was negative, then when I take the absolute value of it, it will make it positive, right? So when they're looking at this to see, to make that determination with the critical value, right, they're making sure you take the, core, the absolute value of R. That's what that little bit right there on C is talking about. 0.95 is greater than the 0.878, right? That was the critical point, right? So therefore, a positive linear relationship exists between X and Y. Boom, done. Question? None? Y'all good? So they can ask you about that. They can ask, also ask you about this. Let me do this real quick now. Let me go back over to my calculator, and let's just hit graph. See, if I stored that equation there, when I hit graph, guess what it look, Guess what it do, does for me? It'll plot it on there too, right? Does that make sense? We call that a BOGO, buy one, get one. And now it's free, right? There we go. We've got plot, got regression line on that and everything. So there, because they're going to ask you, hey, does your graph, which one of your graphs matches it, right? They'll ask you, it's one of the problems out of 15 that does that. Okay, y'all good? All right, so we've done everything that we can do, right? Yes? All right, good. We talked about critical values, how to type it in, all that other stuff. Now let's kind of look at the rest of the homework. Uh, that's good. Boom. Hey, uh, if the linear correlation between the two variables is negative, what can be said about the slope? It's negative, right? Negative slope, negative what correlation right or association to it right positive slope positive right all right the least squares regression line always travels through x mean y mean that means the mean of all the x's and the mean of all the y's right that those are two coordinate or two points data points that you use to be in order to find the standard deviation of x and standard deviation of y, right? So does it travel through those two points? No. What did I say? Yes. Why would it travel through those two points? If it's the mean of x and then the mean of y, and you're putting a line of best fit, and that's used in it, then it's really good high probability that's going to pass through that right does that make sense okay so there any question y'all good pretty it's more just content on that now um look at this one it says given a scatter diagram comment on the type of relationship that exists right Oh, the data set. Where's, oh, here's the data set. Duh. There's the data set, right? Down below us. So which one of those would correlate with the, that data set, right? I don't know. Well, I could, I guess. Look at my X's. What is happening to my Y's as my X's get bigger? It's decreasing, right? So I know it needs to go in a negative format, right? Right? So there. It wouldn't be A. <laughs> it wouldn't be B. It's either C or what? D, do y'all see how we determine that? And then what I would do is I'd take that table and put it where? In my calculator, right? And then I, I'd do the scatter plot, look at it. Yeah, that looks great. And then I'd go from there, right? 
I do a linear regression, which is stat, arrow to the right for calculate number four. And I'm not going to use for B, I'm not going to use those things, even though those are components that I could use, right? I'm going to let the calculator do the least square regression line, right? Does that make sense? Like it'll give it to me, right? Now, here's the really cool part. Like, this is cool. Let me get, let me do this. It's going to give you, now this right here just kind of is going to blow people's minds. Where's it? That burn it. Let me go here. Uh, yeah. It's going to give you, and this, this people get confused, y equals ax plus b, right? It's going to give you a is some number, right? Like 0 0.5. And then b is what? Like 2.3. I don't know. No, I have a clue. But I, let's, for grins and giggles, let's say it gives you that. And people go, I don't know how to write the equation. Folks, if this is A and this is B, then A goes here, B goes where? A go Y equals 0 0.5X plus 2.3, right? Boom. That's the equation, right? You'd be surprised. That is a huge disconnect when you start doing regression. People are like, I got it, but I don't know what to, uh, what to do with it, right? So there, y'all with me? Kind of being a little bit facetious about that, but really, that's that's really the big thing that we fight on that. All right, so there. And then, what's it as? Graph it, right? If you hit, if you started the regression equation, guess what you could hit now? Graph, boom, actually scatter plot with your line, right? You can pick out which one it is, right? You see what I'm talking about? Don't do this by hand. You got a table, right? Good. Um, hey, guess what? Same exact thing, except here's your table, right? Click there. There's your table. And then if you click here, here's a critical list, right? Yeah, just like the previous, one of the previous problems, right? So what do you think they're going to ask you to do on the, on the test? You've got to be able to do a stat plot, a scatter plot, understand the relationships between, and a regression line, right? And correlation coefficient, right? R. you got to be able to do that, right? Yeah, you, you do that, you're fine. All right, now, what does it mean to say that two variables are positively associated? Positively associated. And then what does it mean for it to be negative? associated right there's no causation right just positive associated as one goes up guess what the other one does goes up too right that's positive association right um the linear relationship between the variables whenever one increases the other does what increase right x and y both go up then for a negative as x goes up what does y have to do got to go down right does that make sense you with me on that? Um, yeah, I got five. Okay. The number of children in a household under three and expenditures on diapers, right? Well, let's think about this. If you've got kids, you understand that is this a positive, negative, or no? The number of kids under three and the uh, expenditures on diapers. As the number of kids under three goes up, what happens to my diaper account? It's going to go up too, right? Does that make sense? So both of them, right? So it's a positive correlation, right? Yeah? All right. All right, good. Um, this one, hey, this right here is exactly like some of the other ones, right? If you could type this in and do a, a, a scatter plot, do a correlation, uh, do a linear regression to get the correlation, be able to do that, you're Jam up jelly type. Yeah? Same thing here, right? It's Now, this one says H, right? Does this say A through H? It does. That means they're probably going to get what? More questions, right? It's like that eight-parter, right? Oh, I hate that. But does, does your calculator or will your calculator give you everything you need? Yes. you got to know how to do it, right? And then this one, guess what? same thing right there once you understand how to do a regression line 
and have that diagnostic on, everything else is a piece of cake, right? All right. And, of course, 15, right? Hey. Now, they're giving you everything just like one of the previous problems where it gave you the X mean, the Y mean, um, the standard deviation of Y, the standard deviation of X, and then the correlation, right? They want you to find the who, the regression line, right? Well, phooey, we're not going to calculate that by hand. We could. That gave us everything we could we had, right? But we're just going to take that table, put it in L1 and L2, boom, just like that, right? Yeah. Any questions? So that was the whole 15 questions in homework number three, right? Chapter four. So th does that make a little bit more sense? I mean, I kind of felt when I left out of here Wednesday that it was like, okay, I'm not too sure that they grasped everything that I, I was putting down, like they were digesting it. Now, does it make a little bit more sense about what we did on Wednesday last week? Yeah? Like, y'all are good. Like, your test closed when? On Wednesday? Let's make it, if it closes on Wednesday, does it close on Wednesday? Let's make it. Ooh, if I make it Thursday, if I make it Thursday, you've got another. It does? Okay, good. Okay. I I, I was hoping that I didn't put it on a, um, a class night. You know why? 